Orgoline or Organon. Tarkon Palace courtyard was replete with the sons of the potentates and their powerful family and friends. Some lately arrived from Fort Onyxis or along with time travel experts from Parthenon or Cilicia and Shra arrived, tightly clad in oily yellow and green chainmail bodysuits completely covered except for the sections where their eyes, noses and mouths were exposed. Shra carried a double-bladed laser sword and Cilicia a laser bolt cannon blaster and laser sword both strapped to her back. Oh look, trust Silpharion to come naked, dangling his great penis. I hope it is loaded, came churlish thought from Shra. He will need to be shooting more than mere spermatoza out here, sister. What a show-off, retorted the mind of Silesia. Yes, but the crowds love it. Gets them all feisty. Look, they cannot help themselves. It's not even trying yet and the ladies and gay gents look like they want to kill to get near him, replied Shra's mind. I hope that is not his strategy, came thought from Silesia. What else did you expect? I do hope Abyss will be back soon. Or even Chris Titan. I would take Micron or even Onyxillion at this point, if they were available, pleaded thought from Shra. Yes, they have been gone a while now. So has father, uncle, and we are left with Carlol, Silpharion, Alphad, Orgul, and Invogrod to champion our cause. Looks, mass, and muscle, but light on neurons, dangerously light, lamented Silesia's mind. Whatever happened to Lakshra? I know, right? Why do you think I insisted we dress up like this? Managing the risk. Correct. And the risk is currently exceedingly high. Confirmed thought from Silesia. Silence. Came loud thought from Silpharion as he ascended the main stone-like steps. Penis swinging all the way leading up to the large threshold before the Tarkon Palace entrance doors where he stopped. The crowd was transfixed on him, all of him, well, mostly the dangling part of him, as he shook his double-bladed laser sword high over his head. It's not a frickin' Earth concert. He needs to get on with it, came secluded thought from Alphad to Carlo. The enemy has landed. We are receiving confirmation from all our great cities. Began Silpharion. A gun grey chainmail bodysuit was thrown from the crowd, landing at Silpharion's feet. Put it on and let's go meet them, came loud and instructive thought from a section of the crowd. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, came chanting, thought spreading throughout the crowd. Well, there you have it, Silpharion's great dick to arms speech, replied the mind of Carlol. Very witty for you, Carlol. Very witty, came thought from giant Orgel. That's because you have an exceptionally low bar, Orgel. Now let's go meet these usurpers. What's the plan, came thought from Alfred. Slow down their advance and stay alive until either Father, Mother, Abyss, Chris Titan, Onyxillion, Micron or Warloki arrive, came thought from Carlo. Any order of arrival works for me. And there it is, sister. The plan, came secluded thought from Silesia. Good call on dress code. Let's go. Keep close came secluded reply from Shra's mind. As, Silfa as Silpharion pulled up his zipper, the main electron perimeter shield was raised at the front of the invincible city, outpoured its fighting forces fully girded for battle. Over at Fort Onyxis Or, the same occurred, 
but in an orderly, menacingly controlled, professionally trained manner. The troops split into four pronged formation. One prong was scheduled to connect with the armies of Orgeline Orr, while providing a slanted line of protection across Shonixil's land of wormholes. The opposite side intended to cut off access to Parthenon Orr, funneling all enemy forces down the centre to meet the main vanguard marching up the centre, which contained some of the most formidable warriors in the Milky Way. The fourth deployed along the widest possible back channel route, encircling the flanks on the far side of the land of the Humpkies on the outer right flank and the farthest side of Parthenon or on the outer left flank. Solar System Invasion Force Organon Field Marshal Bell, we're ready, came thought from Clarcilia. Grab your weapons. No more time for sentiment. Just stay alive. Let's go. Ilan Bell moved quickly ahead, followed by a group of officers and commanders, including Generals Thom and George of England. Princess, princes, stay close to me. Whatever happens, stay close, shouted the field marshal. She jumped out of the hovering craft close to the front line facing Orgeline Orr, not realising her view was skewed as the closer they advanced the more it would appear that Orgeline Orr was shifting further away to her troop's left flank. I didn't know officers were expected to lead the charge. Ancestor Richard III was the last English monarch to sally forth into battle and that didn't go well noted Thom to George as they followed behind Elan Bell. Here we are generals, brother, not princes nor kings. Roll with it, came brash response from George, raising his laser bolt shooter in arm while running hard to keep up with the field marshal. She ran toward the Organinian army appearing on her horizon, unaware of the trap as the terrain slanted downward obscuring any honest view of what really lay ahead. Green Sweet, Tarkon Palace, Orgeline Orr. Who is it? What are you doing here? Show yourself. Came weak, secluded thought from Macrollis. His eyes were blurry, the green light prevented his ability to focus his energies. He rose and felt his way around his suite until he got to the screen, pulling the covering away to, to let light in to challenge the un overbearing greens. Macrollis hazily beheld the person before him. What? You? What do you want? To talk, Imperator. Talk about what all is said and done. Leave me. I want to talk about the power of love. Surely you have time, my lord. Answered Matavan Augur, using the human tongue. Matavan Augur, faithless Organinian, look upon what you are party to. Is this who you seek advice from? One whose punishment is being bereft of love replied Macrollis. Metarvan moved closer. The sight of Macrollis shocked him as the light entering the room revealed the pale hue of Macrollis's skin. His eyes were almost green and the area around them sallow, leading down to gaunt cheeks. My lord, I am ashamed to say I can see no trace of a smile on your face. You who I met in Aia's sparkling ivory circle so long ago back on planet Earth, he recalled. I seek no pity from you. Talk to me of love, but know this, I have no memory of the moment you speak of. My shame 
my abuse, my only love is the comfort that death would deliver from the te this terrible nightmare you colluded, responded Macrollis. Stricken by shame, Metarvan fell upon his knees before Macrollis and bent his head. No, my lord, you are the imperator, you are loved. Look, look, look out of the, that screen. The sky is blotted out by the onslaught of allied forces from the solar system. Here for you, led by one who loves you, speak not of death. If you have no memory of you before now, then let me remind you, you are Macrollis, the first organet, the first of my kind. Your skin is golden. You are the son of the rulers of Kratol. You were crowned an emperor and an imperator. And you are the husband of the one who leads the army that invades my world. Death is not love when love makes its intention so terribly clear. Explained Matavan. Macrollis looked down upon the diminutive seeming figure of a warrior kneeling before him. Love seeks to speak through you, Metarvan, for such words you utter bring life back to my mind. Lightly I recall the one of whom you speak. So, what has love done to you? asked Macrollis. Love is in me always now. Are you aware of trines? Responded Metarvan. My jailers speak of it, but outside of their incoherent ramblings. I know not trines, answered Macrollis. Under the light of our three stars, of which Santastia the largest rules invincibility, which is above us and beginning to wane, to wit our intellectual star will begin its cycle over us. But after these two celestial bodies pass, we will enter Trine's cycle. It rules sexual relationships, its glow, it gl its glow is red, and it binds three hearts into one. Love becomes truth, and those who Trine binds become like magnets, unceasingly attracted to one another, entangled through all eternity. Described Metarvan. I know no love here, Organinion, snarled Macrollis, seeming now feral in disgust at the thought of the twins trying to him. This is why I come. Tell me, you speak candidly of death, but do you dream of death, Imperator? Do you die in your dreams, constantly? Night after night, die after a kiss, die after making love, die after the merest embrace. Night after night, like I do. Disclosed Metarvan. Macrollis opened his sullen greenish eyes. A slight glint of pity leaked out as he looked upon Metarvan, who now looking up, eyes wide open seeking absolution a cure from his haunting, considering his confession. What you speak of is strange to me. My dreams are of life. A lady with a fiery sword stands guards, guard in front of a doorway leading into my heart. She smiles at me when I try to leave my heart. She comforts me, places her hand on me and promises me she will ever protect me. She talks to me of spiritual and physical love, complaining loudly when I cry, raising fire in my spirit, pointing to the things she has placed in the fire to ensure it is never extinguished. Once I dreamt Death seeking me, stalking me, and attempting to follow me into the garden she stands guard in front of. 
but the fiery lady cut down death with her sword, and it fled. No Metavan augur, death has no dominion in my dreams. Replied Macrollis. Metavan's head rose and he gazed upon Macrollis. Do you know the name of this fiery lady? Or has your day become your night and your night your day? I am jealous of you, for this is not in my heart. For there is none in my heart that seeks to protect me from death. We all die, night after night we all die. Macrollis laughed like misery in a silver wrapping, his irony on display. You see me as I am in myself ever always since being here. No mind in me to recall. Why? Do you know the names of those you embrace before dreaming your death? Asked Macrollis. I know who I love. You should too. Your lover's name is Sil Africa. She is your spouse, your imperator, and once your empress, the daughter of high humans, Empress Shajola I, and a regal Ethiopian warrior, Silija Mingwitsu. It is she who brings force of arms to bear on my world beyond all expectation and probability. And now I know in you, Lord, even in you, she stands guard over your heart. Finally, I understand each our doom, the power of love. Acknowledged Matavan. Sil Africa. Yes, how foolish of me to forget her name or who she is. I have found myself uttering her name, and abused often have I been for doing so, but I swear I was innocent, and said the name with no malice intent. For the lighted part of this place's cycle finds me often mindless, drifting from green to green with no access to past or future me. You, Metavan, are my first guest, the first who I have spoken to, and evidently you bring me release, declared Macrollis. Not merely release, in mind, release in fact, my imperator, love will kill me, take me to the place where the houseless souls of the enhanced go. I am sure of this now, that we have spoken. Matarvan stood up and looked into Macaulay's eyes. I want to enter death with one good deed to boast of, lest it is a place that one communes with all one has done when one lived. If this is so, maybe you, your Majesty, will call my name from time to time, in a pleasant manner, so those around me in my afterlife say, He is different from us. He did one good deed. Go, Imperator, leave this place. Your captivity is wrong, and maybe Sil Africa and her armies will spare the invincible city its citizens and beloved leaders. Maybe, because like you, we the enhanced have all been deceived. Replied Matavan. How may I leave like this, a braggart dyed green, in the wool for all to know I am claimed as slave to the Cyrene twins? As he spoke, Matarvan had already disrobed, and stood before him naked, his mountain of technological armour and weaponry beside him in a pile. Go, Lord, dirt yourself in my attire, 
pull the visor over your face. None will halt you from your path out of the city because my cloth represents the highest honour from Fort Onyxis or the warrior city. One who is dressed like this may take any life not protected by the will of the potentates without reason or excuse. All I ask is that you remember me, my one good deed. I will die. I feel it, for my love is wedded to my death. This is my dream. Before Metarvan finished, Macrolis had clothed himself, appearing as a mighty lord, but for his pale skin and dull eyes, which had a green mist in them. Metarvan Augur, tell me, who forms the trine you speak of? I am curious, asked Macrolis. Metarvan smiled and answered glibly, The misguided, my lord. Who else could it be? Now listen carefully. He provided instructions to Macrolis, who absorbed what was said and performed it in the manner it was uttered. Macrolis stood outside the confines of the invincible city. The years of his imprisonment at an end. But freedom in and of itself is a dangerous thing, and he knew himself lost in this alien terrain, at least for a moment. Macrolis found a quiet cleft of jagged brash red and sienna rock. He came upon a crack between the jagged rock, where a pinnacle had been snapped off, probably by the pummeling feet of troops, orgologs, or many surface craft. It presented a flat surface. He sat. The light outside began to peel and diffuse the green hue in his eyes, and they became grey again. Not long it was before his skin in patches returned to gold, relinquishing its paleness. But no smile, no sense of purpose, only the experience of liberation and a very faint glow of red began to populate around the crown of the helmet he wore. Macrolis looked up and his heart followed, jolting upward, and he cried out in the direction up in the sky that he now sensed, then knew for sure, Sil Africa was. Harm a strand on or dreadlock off her head, cousin, and answer to me. Sent thought did Macrolis while racking his fist at the clutch of what appeared, like stars clashing far off in distant deep space. Deep space, Alpha Centauri. What? He is free? How, fools? came unguarded thought from Abyss. Everyone immediately around him and on his fleet heard his revulsion. Sil Africa, molten red down to her waist, suddenly reclaimed her fleshy form and flame was replaced by the brightest red glow ever before seen around the top of her head. Since the blessed days before war, times when her happiness and sense of heaven led her to love, marriage and enthronement, a brief contentment, a glow many had not seen on her in years, clearly appeared and her family and friends by her side knew something significant had surely altered on Organon's surface. Kratolians, prepare for my landing, came thought from Diana Tapp. Welcome, first citizen. Yes, of course, we are excited at your arrival. We cannot wait to see you, came thought in response from Cyberscribe, Shando. 
Diana expressed patriotic thought to the pilots in her flight team. Attention! I have a family matter to attend to on Europa. Continue to your destination. I will rejoin you soon. The fleets from the asteroid belt are behind you. I have given instruction that they continue to follow your path. Until you rendezvous with General Treze. Thereafter the General will assume command, and we the Kratolians will enter Alpha Centauri to bolster the war effort. Remain strong. Stay proud. Keep reminding yourselves of your victories. Kratol has been saved. We defeated a formidable enemy. Our alliance with Earth remains strong. The quarantine zone around the asteroid belt has been lifted and its industry restored. Yes, a struggle or two still lies ahead of us, but we have shown that we Kratolians have what it takes to survive. Stay focused, my fellow citizens. Remember who we are and we will always be triumphant. The clutch of craft parted company with the craft Diana piloted after she relinquished the remote pilot controls. Her craft floated downward through Europa's atmosphere into the craft portal atop Jupiter Tower where she landed. Clip, Diana was gone. Shando, what happened? inquired Thought from Ariane turning to look at the medic. He stood on one side of her with what looked like a grin or a smirk she could not tell. Medic, what are you wearing on your face? A mask, came reflexive thought response from the medic, pulling his mask up, covering his nose, mouth and smirk. As I thought, for a moment I imagined I was in enemy hands, came thought from Ariane with a momentary slant eye stare at him. Viceroy, the Organinian battle fleet has retreated from above our orbit, replied Shando's mind. Well, that is exceptionally good news. Diana saved us, right? came thought from Ariane. No, Viceroy, she paused, realising she was not quite sure how they were saved. We have been so busy down here that she decided to switch it up. By the way, Viceroy, Diana has arrived. She'll be here any moment now. Great. How did we defeat the Organinian invaders? Persisted thought from Ariane. Shandau went large. Yes, Viceroy, for sure. Thanks to Diana, we defeated the invaders. She is a giant amongst Kratolians. You must be immensely proud of her. Who said I wasn't? Ariane developed feelings. Odd for Kratolians especially this high up the food chain. Is that what they whisper, Shanda? Do they think I am not proud of Diana? Do they think I resent her success? No, Viceroy. Oh, just call me Ariane. I don't want to be a damn Viceroy. I just want to be Ariane. I love Diana. I adore her. I am so proud of her and I know what it means to be a Kratolian with Diana on our team. Vice, I mean, Ariane? No one here questioned your devotion or allegiance. Her thoughts were interrupted. But they do, I know they do. She turned to the medic. You smirk at me, thinking I am stupid, made more so by your slumber drugs. I am woke now, and I remember all the things I have said and done since the attempted coup. I do, and as I reflect, I know I hurt our people my fellow Kratolian citizens, and ultimately, Diana, the one I love. She paused, and Macrolis, our son, the one we all adore. Forgive me, Shando, do you think Kratol will ever forgive me? Be honest, streamed emotive thought from Ariane. The medic lowered his head and sent thought. Ariane? Our first citizen, you are no longer in shock. You have recovered. 
Ariane looked at him as he removed his mask, revealing his face while observing hers. Sincerity in his expression, she turned to Shando to see care in her demeanour. Both also looked relieved. I have been horrible, she streamed. I know I have, when I reflect it's just horrible. Spilled out emotion dressed as thought did Ariane. No, Ariane. Stop. Please stop. We are at war. The best laid plans of mice and men. They, they, as they say on earth, you can reflect and judge your own behaviour. You will be always be your harshest critic. Because you start from a place where there is no love, but we see you through love's lens and always knew you were unwell, suffering from shock. I for one can forgive you because you were not in control of your primary faculties. Came thought from the medic. Shandao sent thought. I too forgive you, Ariane. Without reservation, terrible things happen during war. Clip. Diana appeared. My love, the perpetrator is not always to blame for their actions. I too have done terrible things lately. In the name of Kratol, I find it easy to forgive you because I love you. Oh, Diana, effused the mind of Ariane. She sat up on the edge of her levitating flat surface and spread her arms, one either side, to welcome Diana without, within, without reservation. Diana entered, and Ariane hugged her, not realising that the unborn twins, Ayaria and Diala, glowed, glowed golden and red with ecstasy to be able to feel Diana against their mother's tummy. I love you, too. Are you well? What terrible things did you do? They would have been, would have been awfully bad to be worse than the terrible things I did. Ariane held up her sapphire and crushed diamond encrusted fingernails. Oh, Diana, did you see what these did to Councillor Critgol? They took his hand clean off. In one swipe. I was going to get my toenails done. But knowing what I know now, I cannot do that. It would be hazardous to your health. Come, hug me again, so happy to see you. Only you, Ariane, only you, mumbled Diana as she embraced Ariane, again smiling broadly. She turned to the medic, thank you, then to Shandau, she, mo she, she mouthed similar words, thank you so much. The cyber scribe and the medic left the first citizens alone in that place. Diana helped Ariane off the flat surface onto her feet, holding her firmly around her waist. Ariane, with her arm around Diana's shoulder, gradually they made their way to the visor screen, looking out from Jupiter Tower over the Europa horizon. My brother betrayed my trust, Diana. Through me, he deceived you. I have been in the background watching my shock and listening to what was happening around me, unable to intervene. But I can come to no other conclusion where Felix is concerned. It hurts me, and I am sorry. Ariane released tears. Diana turned to face her as they stood at the visor screen. She pressed her lips tight, tensely, together, at the sight of tears. I came here to share thought with you about that. Ariane lifted her hand, palm facing Diana's temple. She placed it gently upon it. Shh was the sound she made. We both miss Macrollis, Diana. Do you think he will ever forgive us? We must save him first. That is also what you came to let me know, isn't it? You are going to Alpha Centauri to save our son. Yes! Isn't everyone going to save Macrollis? They both smiled, a wry smile. A lightning bolt cracked out in the distance 
emerging in a fluffy cluster of orange and purple cloud. Down it struck, the liquid swirling surface foamed, and the lightning strike was swallowed up. After this is over, Ariane, we have been doing this since we were teenagers. I have been promising myself a holiday since I was 15. I am over 100 now, and I still haven't taken a vacation. We should have done it when I was expecting Macrollis. But there was too much going on. And now you carry twins. I guess after this we will again find some new event to keep us occupied. Or you will. Or let's say maybe you, me and the twins be a family. Here on Europa, perhaps? Turn our back on public life, maybe. They look down at the construction work partially completed within view of the tower. Fairchild Metropolis, I hear he calls it, came thought from Ariane. He will not be permitted to return. If he succeeds, he will go wherever he chooses. I only hope you stop him before that happens. Me too, Ariane. Felix turned the humans against us, then turned the enhanced against each other, and now he will watch and witness as the Clipsiles rain down, destroying our illusions of Nirvana. Hate is, a, is dangerous, if left to fester, came thought from Diana. He hates us all. Our hateful past resurrected itself. I feel it inside me. No more first citizen for me. I am not fit to be steward over others. The crimes I carry in my blood for my family's Nazi past. They do not deserve me, Diana. We have time for therapy later. We will face danger. We still face danger, Ariane. I remember doing this a long time ago. When the Western Alliance attacked Tamp Mansions. Here I am again. Urging you to go. To save our future. Stakes are higher now, Diana. But you must not stop. You must stop him. You know this is right. Are you sure, Ariane? Yes. If you need to kill Felix, do not hesitate. Because he will not hesitate to kill you. Go, Kratolian. Go. Clip. Diana was gone. Shando, please come. I need your assistance. Bring that medic, came thought from Ariane, balancing on her own feet for the first time in many cycles. Organon, Alpha Centauri. Field Marshal Bell, look called out a Kratolian officer. Resistance up ahead. Prepare to engage. Weapons at the ready, cried out Field Marshal Bell. The front ranks of the Kratolian forces met Orgolene Ore warriors at the midway point between the Invincible City and the Allied encampment. Giant Orgol led the advance. Short on tactics, Orgol ploughed headlong into a battalion of Kratolian troops. They could not contain him. Field Marshal, they have a giant amongst their rank. He is decimating our front line, reported an officer. I will be there, came secluded thought from Ilan Bell. You, follow me, said Ilan, pointing to a heavily armed squad. The Kratolians are here, I hear, but I cannot see them. All I see are Insects. Look, brother, came thought from giant Orgul. He held up a Kratolian soldier by the head, with one hand, with the soldier's face in eyeshot of Alphad. Orgul slapped his other hand against the head, making a clapping sound, crushing it flat. He let the soldier fall 
to the terrain, dead. Good work, brother. We will be done with this lot soon enough. Keep it up, came thought from an impressed Alfred. Generals Thom and George found themselves in the group following Ilan Bell. Suddenly they came upon Orgol, but he saw them first and jumped from where he stood, a mighty leap landed in the middle of their company. Soldiers scattered, electron shields were activated to parry Orgel and prevent his hand from grabbing them. He became enraged and lashed out with his laser blade sword, but it crashed against a grouping of electron shields erected to contain him. But Orgel was a giant, and with his other huge hand, he grabbed a jagged surface boulder as he bent and swiveled away from the rebuff of the electron shields. He lifted it with that huge hand, hurling it at the grouping of Kratolian soldiers containing him. It smashed through, even as one tried to blast the rock before it did damage. The rock was too large and crushed two Kratolian soldiers beneath it. Ilan jumped out in front of Orgel, her laser blade sizzled, sparkling, viciously causing Orgel to hesitate. Die now, oversized one, this galaxy is tired of you, came thought from Ilan as she drove her laser blade at his heart, intending to pierce right through it, but Orgel swatted her weapon away, lurched forward and landed a large crippling punch against her shoulder. Ilan fell backward but was caught by General George. His brother leapt ahead of Orgel, laser cannon blasting bolts at the giant, but Alfad leapt up flying with his shock pole aimed at General Thom's neck. His prescient body suit reinforced itself and both Alfad and Shockpole were repelled. However, worse was to come, as Silpharion appeared, having cut a deadly path through the thick fighting. Coming upon Thom, he struck out with his laser blade like a lightning strike. Prescient pulled its content to ground, permitting the sizzling blade to pass over the general's head. Silpharion, feeling cheated, jumped to the place where Thom bent, kicking at Thom, jabbing the ground with the tip of his laser sword, but Thom's prescient bodysuit expressed intermittent electron shields to block each kick and jab from the great gate, while Thom kept rolling away, back, back to the thicket of Kratolian soldiers, until a larger contingent of European troops arrived in the area, fast becoming the primary conflict zone. The Europeans were blocked from going further by strong Karlol and Invogrod, supported by a group of their warriors, but Europeans were brutal, forming a laser blast line, firing laser bolts at the sons of the potentates, who materialized shields to block the blasting. Silpharion continued to follow the rolling Thom into the Kratolian ranks where they fell upon the great gate, hacking at him and firing laser bolts, but he was quick, unruly, and soon joined by Alfad and Orgel, all three spotting the rejuvenated field marshal as she prepared to re-enter the fray. George, are you ready? Keep your head low. That's what they will aim for. Let's go. I'm ready, field marshal replied the general. Clip, Ilan disappeared. Thom was helped to his feet by a group of humans recently arrived. Come, follow me, ordered General Thom. Without rebuke, the human battalion followed behind Thom as he surged forward after Silpharion, spotting the great gate and his siblings encircling his brother, General George. Clip, Ilan appeared behind Orgel, driving her laser blade into his thigh. It was as tall as her, and he screamed out, kicked out, caught Elan in the kick. But clip, she was gone, leaving Orgel in brief pain, but being Orgonet, Orgel's body tissue healed quickly, 
and he pummeled into a line of Kratolians to exact retribution. Tom and company attacked Silpharion, brave indeed the English prince, as Silpharion bent and raised his head, his eyes burned like Suntastia's surface, but Thom in prescient unfazed swung his laser cannon from front to back, and, and then from back to front, blasting a bolt at the great gate's head. Silpharion swung his head to the left, then right as only the enhanced can, raced at General Thom, his free-fisted hand smouldering like a furnace, Prescient, re Prescient resisted, resisted as Silpharion drove that fist against the young general's state of the art body suit. The human troops raced to his aid, blasting bolts at the great gate, but Santastia's starlight made him worse. Clip, he was gone. Clip, he reappeared, all the time avoiding the laser blast bolts, refusing to disengage his fist fast upon Tom's protective body suit. Great Prescient glitched a nano moment, proving its weaknesses when confronted head on by the enhanced. The gap in real time was sufficient for Silpharion's fist to pass through Prescient's defences. Silpharion reached in, tore through Tom's chest, grabbed his heart, wrenched it out, dashed it down to the ground before the English crown prince's feet. Prescient would not let the great gate access its content twice, but once was enough. George and Elan saw what was done. I can't breathe, said Thom, before it occurred to him that he was dead. Lonely heart, beating, beating there on the ground, by his feet, momentarily before his eyes met his feet, then splat. Silpharion's boot stomped down on it. Prescient kept the corpse upright, unclear of its protocols, until it eventually registered. Content unrecoverable, Prescient deactivated and General Thom's corpse collapsed in a heap. Clip, Elan disappeared. Clip, she reappeared, ahead of Silpharion, immediately engaging him with laser blade sword and electron shield. I know you. You were here in Tarkon Palace. Why lead this pitiful rabble? Humans have no business in our wars. Came taunts from the mind of the Great Gate. No response got he from her, just a swoosh of a sizzling laser blade as it seared toward his heart, but Silpharion dodged it, then laughed as Orgil appeared, grabbed Elan, lifting her by one foot, up, off the ground, intending to dangle her head in his bloodied hand. Wait! Hold her there. Yes, right there. I'm going to remove her head, came thought from Silpharion. Orgel obliged, lifting Elan's foot slightly higher, for Silpharion to remove her silvery head. head. Clip! Elan disappeared. Clip! She reappeared on Orgel's shoulder. With the deftest of manoeuvres, she used her broad shoulder to jump. She used his broad shoulder to jump upward using enhanced strength, launched herself upward. Gravity brought her down, eyes sparkling like the enhanced do when they are about to kill, swinging her double-sided ignited laser-bladed sword with all her might. The Kratolian Field Marshal's weapon hissed and spat, spitting sparks as it seared through Orgel's giant neck, emerging on the other side. She landed on the ground, jumped up again, kicking Silpharion backward. He tripped over a dead body behind him, stumbled but recovered in time to witness his baby brother, giant Orgel's toppled head, rolling away from him, followed by the fall 
of his brother's great giant body coming down like a crashing tower. Alfred stood staring, surprised, but he should have remained alert. George, crazed with raging, rushing rage at the killing of his brother, bundled Alfad over. With the aid of Prezient, he pinned him down sufficiently so to release laser-blasting bolts at the beautiful son of the potentate's pretty head. Clip, Alfad was gone. Clip, Alfred reappeared, closer to Carlo, grabbing at half his face. The other half remained with George, who kept blasting, kept blasting, kept blasting, until that side of Alfred's face existed no more. Clip! Ilan appeared to pull George away from the remaining scorched sinew. She hugged George tight in the middle of the battle, encircled by Kratolians, Europeans and humans providing a protective electron shield. Brother, who did this to you? came shocking thought from Carlo. Clip, me, answered Felix de Silva, while driving a deep red double-bladed laser sword through Alphad's heart. The beautiful son of the potentates died twice. Felix swung the corpse skewered on his sword to one side then rounded upon Carlo. You, you, but we are kin, poured out thought from Carlo. Let this be the last time you scum on this ochre rock, call me kin again, came thought in reply from Uncle Felix to Silver.